We're so excited to be here with you all. As Gerald said, this is our fifth community of practice, which is really tremendous. At the last STEM Solutions Conference, announced the third cohort of 19 ecosystems. That now brings us to 56 ecosystems across the country. Really incredible. Where we are right now as a nation and a high degree of questioning of science, we really badly need leaders in the community, like the lead STEM leaders, who can serve as a voice for why STEM is important and relevant for our future as a, as a nation and the world. We have to make sure that all children, it doesn't matter where they come from, what their color of their skin is, whether they're man, woman, or transgender. Everyone has the right to participate in our society. And we have to make sure from early on that we equip them with the opportunities and the skills and the access to be able to participate in our workforce so they can thrive because the only way our communities are going to thrive is if everyone has those opportunities. We know that kids start to drop out of the STEM pipeline early. Thumb um, is early as third grade when content kicks in. When you look at the data, by the time kids get to their junior or senior year of high school, you know, we've got just such a small group that are, in the past, have been thinking about science, technology, engineering careers. So we've got to keep kids engaged earlier on. We're preparing students for the workforce by launching an initiative called the Chief Science Officers and giving students the, um, the power to impact their peers and their communities um, by really speaking about what excites them and they're passionate about science and technology. To me what it means to be a Chief Science Officer is to get a voice out for every student to make sure they each have a saying in STEM, that they all experience it as they get older. Because if we wouldn't have that, we wouldn't have our future mathematicians, engineers, technologists, or like people who want to be scientists as well. Our country faces a workforce shortage in STEM that is born from the fact that the kids are, don't see themselves as STEMists. They don't see a gainful lifetime of work that includes STEM and choose an opt-out throughout their career in K-12. So by the time they're 10 years old, they're thinking about themselves differently. And when we're trying to do this in high school or in community college, we're a bit late. The ecosystems are an opportunity for us to correct that, for us to take on the mission and the mobilization of correcting what's being taught in and out of school so that there are competencies and skills that the kids feel really well about and that they are armed with the ability to innovate and the ability to be successful. So how do you grow your own talent? That's really where we're going to see the success in Missouri, St. Louis, and Kansas City in the coming decades is really by developing effective talent pipelines that feed into industry, but also have the types of skills that they can use to adapt to different types of industries as industry changes. I've been really impressed with what I've seen over the last day and a half, just all these different members of these STEM ecosystem communities in mean, education, on the employer side, even connecting to the policymaker side. You know, it's, there's real grassroots momentum. I think that's something that we as a, as a media organization are looking to kind of capture and, and tell the stories of, you know, what are, what's working in a particular community or sort of what's working on a national scale that can be replicated nationally. So it's really got my head spinning with ideas, so it's really impressive. Because of STEM ecosystems, we are creating a new architecture for how people learn, how systems operate, and how workforces are created. We are creating a new paradigm in an information age post-industrial that our systems today have not been capable of being able to adapt to so that we can truly flourish as a society.